Welcome back to another episode of what is most interesting in FinTech and I'm Nadira Sadikova and today we have a truly inspiring guest with us, Azim Khan. Azim is a serial entrepreneur and the leading figure in the cryptocurrency and decentralized finance space. Uh, and he's a co-founder and CEO of uh, Morp, a company that at the forefront of transforming consumer blockchain technology for everyday use. Beyond that, Azim has made a remarkable impact through his work with Gitcoin, pioneering innovative funding mechanisms that have influenced major global organizations like UNICEF. Welcome, Azim. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to have our conversation today. So today we are going to explore Azim's journey, how he started, not we, how he started more, the challenges he faced, his recent fundraising successes, and what he aims to bring to the blockchain community. And we got to also dive into his broader role in building such a significant venture. Azim, once again, welcome, and let, let's start the conversation. Can you take us back to the beginning? What inspired you to start more, and what was the vision behind the company? You know, honestly, I have been in the blockchain space since 2013, officially. I started writing about Bitcoin for the Huffington Post at the end of 2013, when the New York City Bitcoin Center was opening here in New York City. So I've been around and in the space for a very long time. For parts of it was an observer, for parts of it was sort of just researching, for parts of it was trading. You know, the ICO boom in 2017, the NFTs in 2021, a lot of the trading that happened during the bull and bear cycles of just the time that I've been here. It's been a really long time. I actually had started a company also in 2021 where we were a crowdfunding platform for creators and we were able to build and launch it. I had raised a little bit of venture money. It was 1.25 million, I believe. Nothing, nothing like we raised recently for more. You know, after that, I spent time at Gitcoin, like you had mentioned, for almost two years and really getting a chance to see what's going on in the entirety of the crypto ecosystem. For anyone who may not be familiar, Gitcoin functions or has functioned a lot like a Switzerland in the space. We are a, we were a, you know, essentially a philanthropic venture that would raise money and distribute it to builders in the ecosystem in the form of grants. And so during my time there, I got a chance to explore getting to know the actual builders who were receiving the grants, the high net worth individuals who would help fund the rounds, the DeFi protocols, the venture capital funds, the centralized exchanges where everyone is buying and selling their tokens, and understanding what's going on for builders because we would host different grants rounds on sort of a, a vertical like open source software, Web3 climate, decentralized science. And we had some other verticals in the company as well that I helped oversee. And so part of my job ended up being to really deeply understand crypto from a 10,000 foot perspective. Who are the L2s? Who are the wallets? Who are the bridges? Who are the exchanges? Being able to rank order prioritize the importance of each of them in the categories they were in, and then also being able to understand who are the decision makers at each of those companies that I would need to be able to go to to do something with. And so sort of the cross-pollination of understanding from a 10,000-foot perspective, also understanding things from a very granular place, really helped lead to thinking about if I were in a position to launch something like with more how would I want to go about it? Because I was able to look and say, I like what Base is doing here. I like what Starkware is doing there. I like what Say is doing here. How would I be able to use a little bit of all of what I like and then not do the things that I don't like and put together how we were going to go about doing this? Although the actual inception of Morph is more, more interesting in that this is a company that was originally incubated by the centralized exchange BitGet. They're a Singaporean exchange. Lionel Messi is the face of the exchange. So very well known, mm -hmm. very successful wow. exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who has been 
you know, doing some very interesting things in the ecosystem in terms of other companies they own and acquisitions that they've been doing. And they had been incubating this idea from January or February of 2023. And I met with them during Token 2049 in Singapore last year. And we had a discussion of what it would look like for me to come on board because they wanted to launch it in a way where we would spin it out. It wasn't going to stay as part of the BitGet subsidiaries in a sense. They wanted it to spin out and that required raising outside capital and that required actually being able to take a real leadership role in the company if I were to join. And it was just something where I really sat and I thought, I, I really believe I can do this, especially based on everything I've been seeing, how long I've been in the space, access to the resources I have now, the brand I've been so fortunate to build for myself from a personal brand perspective. And so that's really how it came about. Was It was an opportunity that was presented. And at the time, because of my role at Gitcoin, I used to get a lot of opportunities. It was a very, very good position where I acted as the face of a lot of great work being done. And so I was very visible. And when I really sat with looking at this opportunity over many of the others that had been presented to me, it just felt like the right opportunity for personal growth. I'd say that's like the most honest answer. That's like super perfect, uh, actually, answer. You you just like covered all my questions that I prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let me let me just like yeah ask something really important. So, uh, sure. what what were some of the biggest challenges uh, you faced in the early days of uh, building Warp, and how did you overcome them? Like you know, because it's like a rapidly evolving space, like you know, blockchain. What strategies did you use to ensure more state innovative and ahead of the curve? You know, from a, from a technical perspective, I actually don't end up speaking too much on it because I'm a non-technical founder. Our CTO, Ender, is completely brilliant and amazing at what he does. And from a technical perspective, one of the main differentiators for us is that we have what's called a decentralized sequencer. And so unlike many of the other L2s who run centralized sequencers, and then you can argue if the L2 themselves runs the sequencer in a centralized way, how decentralized is that blockchain to begin with? And if the principles of decentralization matter so much, then wouldn't a decentralized sequencer be truer to the core ideals of Ethereum at the end of the day? And so that is one of the things that we are doing that I think really separates us from a tech perspective. But for me, a lot of it was having been in Gitcoin, having seen all of the L2s launch, having seen all of the alternative L1s launch, and spending time taking a look at what I felt like were difficulties that they were having in being able to create success. Because cool. what I continued to see was, you know, a couple people get together and then they go raise a really large amount of money based on selling a technical dream. And then as they try to go to market, they have massive difficulties doing so. And one of the strange things I've noticed about crypto is it's one of the places that despite marketing being the main thing that drives it, they don't believe in marketing in many ways. They think that tech is what should be the main selling point at the end of the day. And trying to sell you on why this blockchain is better than that blockchain as opposed to the use cases available on said blockchain. And so a lot of our difficulties at these earliest stages came about when we said, okay, it's time for us to go raise money. And when you want to raise capital, you have to be able to tell a compelling story to investors. And these are investors that can take a look and see that there might already be 200 L2s at this point, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's like ludicrous amount of them. And it's not like we were very early. We we're probably at the later stage of these L2s getting funded. And so the biggest difficulty at the earliest stages for us when I officially joined was, what is it that we're going to be able to tell investors that will compel them to give us this large sum of money we're looking to raise? How are we going to do that? Because selling the tech while it's helpful, that's been done. Investors have seen that that's not working very well. What are we going to do differently? And this was where I was benefited from 
my time at Gitcoin again in having chatted with so many of the L2s and seeing what I realized was if you were looking to create success in a blockchain ecosystem, it was sort of thinking about it from the perspective of product and then distribution, as is with all products as a whole that anyone's selling. It, it really bakes it down to, do you have the product and how do you distribute it? And what I kept seeing around me was that people had gotten product right. No one had gotten distribution yep. right. And, and what I tried to do in our pitches to investors was to say that we are incubated by a very large centralized exchange. This centralized exchange has 30 million users. They have a wallet, which is the second biggest competitor to MetaMask which has somewhere between 10 and 15 million users. Perhaps that number is even higher now. They, they own a media company that's very successful in the East. They have a large venture mm -hmm. fund. They own a large stake in a crypto exchange based out of Hong Kong as well. And so they have licenses to be able to legally work within Singapore and Hong Kong. And so what I really tried to sell was this picture of a vertically integrated stack that Morph would have access to through our original partner in incubation. However, saying that because we were not tied to the company and we were not a subsidiary, we were also agnostic in that we can work with other centralized exchanges. We can work with other venture funds. We can work with other anyone, right? Media companies. And so unlike some of the competitors who are in a position that if they're tied to a centralized exchange, they can only use the resources of the centralized exchange. They're branded as the L2 of the centralized exchange. We weren't in that position. And when I thought about what does it look like to create a successful blockchain ecosystem, the first thing you really need to do is have distribution where you get users and TVL and liquidity and transactions. And then you have to after that incentivize builders to come to your chain. And so we were able to show that because of the partners that we have in BitGet and the ecosystem of companies they have, we're in a very good position to do that initial distribution to be able to bring what was needed on chain in a much quicker fashion and with much less spend than anyone else in the same boat, and that we could then focus on the builder side. And why and how would you be able to incentivize builders? And that was part of where, again, my time at Gitcoin came in really helpful because as someone who was overseeing the grants program, I understand mm -hmm. what builders are looking for, where builders are, what builders' problems are, because I spoke to the earliest stages of builders through the founders of some of the most successful companies in the ecosystem. So I know that was a very long answer, but in the early stages, it, I'd say the biggest difficulty was saying, you know, why should you invest in the 200 L2 in us? And why, why is it that we think even though we're later to market and less capitalized than our peers, that we still believe that we have what we need to be able to be successful? Because we raised the $20 million seed round, and that's amazing. Don't get me wrong. But if you look yeah. at some of the yeah, other can, competitors, can they you, hundreds of millions. Yeah. Yeah, this, regarding this fundraising, this is, like, really important. Can you just, like, so we yeah, comment on this part more? Because, like, you know, now... The market is a kind of, a, I can say, I don't know, can I say like that, a bit dead. Like most of the startups, most of the projects are looking for some money. And definitely it would be like super uh, valuable for those who are watching us. Uh, so just like give some recommendations, like how did you like that? I know that Morph is like, you just like really great and awesome product. So like, you know. In a, you're kind of nurturing your uh, community. So as you said, like uh, before onboarding your users, you already just like, uh, so you came in, you offered them a ready-made platform. So not something like, you know, so actually, if you know that when we're going to start fundraising, actually the product is not ready and you start just like pitching the investors. So, but in reality, yeah. there is nothing working. Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, I'm also a venture partner at the BitGet Venture arm of Foresight Ventures. And while at Gitcoin, a big part of my job was raising money for a variety of things. And so I think part of it was 
that I had already built relationships with different venture capitalists across the board in the ecosystem. And why that's important is that being someone who already has a warm connection or a warm introduction is way more valuable than being in a position than, than being in a place you don't, where you're just getting a cold reach out. And so I think that okay. the honest answer is part of that, you know, I had done a lot of work in public where when I was at Gitcoin, we did a large deal with UNICEF that I led. We did a large deal with Shell Oil that I led. We did a large deal with the American Cancer Society that I led. And so I had a track record within the industry that I could show, understand how to execute from start to finish with large organizations outside of Web3, but also within Web3, having worked with so many more. So having those pre-existing relationships helped. But what also was important is because I'm a part-time VC myself, I understand what it is that VCs are looking for and what they want to hear and how they need to be hit. And I've actually written about this pretty extensively for Coindesk. Perhaps when we put the episode out, we can share the article. I think I did two articles for Coindesk about sort of just raising funds and some of the things you need to think about when talking to investors. But a lot of it really boils down to few questions that they're looking to have answered in a deck, which is, what is it that you're building? How yeah. big is the market for what it is that you're building? How is it that you plan to go about being able to capture that market? How profitable is the potential of this idea? How far along are you in having built it? And why are you the team? that actually has the ability to do it, right? And I think that if more entrepreneurs found a way to use their decks to explain those simple concepts, as opposed to, in my experience, as someone who's heard a thousand pitches, everyone goes really, really yeah. deep into their product and, and they, they, because they're so in love with the idea, and which makes sense. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing is, is that their incentive is not the same incentive of the VC. The VC is there to make a bet on you, potentially, so that you can make them money for their investors. Because at the end of the day, a VC is really just a middleman for wealthier individuals and organizations. They have LPs who give them money that they get invested in from whether it's large endowments or pension funds or high net worth individuals, whatever it may be. They pull this capital and then they take risky investments with the opportunity to potentially try to do a one. When an entrepreneur is talking to a VC, to deeply understand what is the job of a VC. A job of a VC is not to take a bet on you just, to, just because yeah. like, they like you or anything like that. Their job is to look for opportunities that will allow them to make money for their investors, plain and simple. And so, exactly. you know, when, when you you really look at it like that, it changes the way you talk to the investor. You say, hey, this is what I'm building, and this is how big the market is. This is how we think we can get part of that market with how we want to go about doing things. This is how far along we are. This is why we're the team to do it. And because of this story I'm telling you, that's why I can make you your money back. It's not a charity by any means. I think a lot of people think, VC should just take a chance on someone. And it's no, it's their job to make money. And so if you give them the story of how what you're doing will help them make money, you're in a much better position to have them listen to you. Yeah. Yeah, like perfectly right. Like talking about money. So can you tell more mm -hmm. about this business model of more, how you are making money out of it? And like when you started actually so earning uh, some funds, I don't know, like monetization models and everything. It's really interesting as well. So for us at the moment, we're still in what's called testnet. And so we haven't gone live mm -hmm. fully yet. We're looking to go live in the next quarter of 2024. And so we'll be fully live. While you're on testnet, you can do transactions, but all those transactions are with play money. There's no mm -hmm. actual Ethereum or, or staples that are used. Yeah. On mainnet, it'll be real Ethereum being used. One of the simplest will be that 
as we have more transactions take place on the blockchain itself, the blockchain will earn fees from those transactions. Each time that a transaction takes place on any application that's built with on, on top of more, we will be able to get a small piece of that transaction fee. And so that's one of the main ways that we're going about being able to earn money. After that, it's, it's honestly a strategy that we're going about where what we've seen is that in this ecosystem, everyone focuses on getting 1,000 or 2,000 mm -hmm. low quality but high volume number of projects. And then they don't really give them any resources to help build, launch, and scale those companies. The difference is, is that we're looking to be in a place where we create a scenario that we have potentially way less companies that end up successfully launching. But we will be investing in those companies and we will be able to help those companies then raise venture capital. We'll be able to help those companies uh -huh. launch a token and we'll be able to then take part in the success that comes with, you know, our block space gets used for very good applications and we earn money on that. But we'll also have invested in some of the best projects that would be in the ecosystem. So when they launch and they're successful and they have tokens that come out, we'll also earn based on that. And so it's one of the main two ways that we've been looking at how we plan on doing that. And we are also thinking about incubating some projects that we feel need to be created mm -hmm. despite having entrepreneurs who aren't yet or thinking about building some of those things and putting teams in place so that we can help launch those projects. Yeah, it's like, for example, Telegram is also giving grants for building on their fund. So platform is like something like yeah. that, right? So we're going to just like incentivize the interesting projects. Okay, but what is your opinion regarding that? Like, can more projects uh, be considered as a fintech project, as a kind of a part of? What do you think? Like, it's really interesting because there are actually two, uh, I'll say, camps. One type of people think that blockchain and crypto, uh, cryptocurrency related projects is not like kind of a part of fintech. But the second part is saying that it's a part of the fintech because it's an innovation. It's a technological advance, advancement. It's also kind of uh, you are just giving some solution in the finance, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say that blockchain companies as a whole, not necessarily just decentralized finance companies, are an evolution of fintech because in a sense, yeah. I think at one point we will stop talking about companies that are being built on blockchain and it'll just be understood that if you're building a company, it's built on blockchain for the most part. And so I do believe it's an advancement in fintech. And I think that it's very clear to see that the future of the next iteration of the global economy will be built on blockchain. Yesterday, there was an announcement out of the UAE between Phoenix Group uh -huh. and Tether that they're launching yeah. a dirham backed stable coin. And so, uh -huh. you know, we'll be able to move away from just US dollar stable coins needing to be used everywhere and, and dirham backed ones within the UAE, which is you know, their currency. And so countries are taking the idea of this very seriously. And it's hard to look at it from my perspective and say that this isn't an advancement in what's going on in fintech as a whole. I just think that Fintech as a definition prior to blockchain was a much smaller set of potential companies, whereas this broadens the idea of what fintech is as a whole. Because if governments are using it at scale to launch their own versions yeah. of stable coins for digital payments that will be used in their country the same way regular currency in paper is, that that's a very, very massive advancement in fintech in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. Also, I really, uh, because you played the kind of a remarkable role in building more into what is today, right? So, and can you also walk us through your leadership principles do you live by? Like, how do you apply them in your work? Sure. So one thing I always say, I'm very blessed and fortunate to have amazing, amazing colleagues. My co-founder, Cecilia, is amazing. My my CTO Ender is great. Honestly, everyone that we've hired has been excellent. The way that I see my job as a founder is have honestly only three main jobs. 
the first one is make sure there's enough money in the bank that everyone can do their jobs without thinking that they might not get paid. That's a super interesting part to me. And maybe the most important part to me is making sure that we have enough money in the bank. Secondly, it's about constantly scouting and recruiting for the best talent. And so part of my job is definitely to go out there and be meeting with people that I think would be great for ecosystem BD, for development relations, for actual being engineers, whatever it might be, to be able to go out, meet with the best talent that we can onboard. And then finally, is to be in a place where I can help set the vision and strategy of how I think things need to go. And then after that, so honestly, and I find that my job is really to hire people who tell me what to do. I don't think my job is to hire people and tell them what to do. After I've set the vision and strategy, I think it's important that I am rigid with where I believe we need to go, but flexible in how we get there. And so if we hire people who have different ideas on how they feel we can accomplish those goals, it's my job to find a way to unblock anything in their way and give them the resources they need to be able to help us get to that goal. I find a lot of people hire with this method of micromanagement, and it's just not what I do. I hire great people and I say, you tell me what you need from me, and then you go out and do your job and then come back to me when you need something. And also, I just, uh, while researching your profile, it was like super kind of impressive. You have like lots I would say, like, really visible, visible philanthropic uh, life. So is it like your own initiative? Because most of the time when I see that, you know, crypto, I would say the people from the technology, blockchain, and crypto-related project, they're all about money. Money, I have yeah. to make money. <laughs> when, when, I, when I just, I say, okay, like, to UNICEF and some other, like, bigger brands that you just, like, you know, help just uh, to nurture the community, you made a right, reasonable contribution and you say, wow, like, this is kind of, is it? Yeah. yeah. Honestly, it's, it's just something that when I think about this technology as a whole, I think about how it has the ability to empower and uplift people around the globe. First and foremost, there have been a lot of opportunities in my career where I probably could have made a lot of money and I don't have a lot of money. I do very well for myself and I'm very grateful for everything that I have. But I, I don't drive a Lamborghini. I still have a mortgage. <laughs> still all the you know, like I'm I'm extremely grateful for all that I have, but like the crypto wealthy people, I'm I'm not one of them. But that's not the reason I do what I do. I think that candidly, since I'm playing a long game, it's probably very likely that I end up coming into large sums of money. But really the money is not what drives me at the end of the day. I think that if money was the only thing that drove me, I would not be able to work as hard as I do or be inspired to do things. Because if at the end of the day, the, the thing that you care most about is buying a watch or a, or a car or something like that, and that's really like your end goal. I would love Rolexes and I'd love to drive a Ferrari every day. But that's not what motivates me every day for, for doing things. Whereas when I think about how this technology can actually help people around the world, I think that one of the things that bothers me about our space is that they don't realize that you can help people and make money at the same time. I think that yeah. you can do that, you know? Is that Exactly. So for me, a lot of what I do is driven by being in a position that I think, you know, I just happened to get lucky that I cared about this space so long ago that I've been in it, that I've compiled a lot of information and just data points that allow me to even have a better intuition of how I think things need to go. And in the long run, I think that there's no way that doesn't generate profits for myself personally. But in the meantime, I think that it would be sad to become one of the people who is driven solely by money when doing this stuff. Because some of the cool things we've been able to do, some of the work with UNICEF, I also work with Mercy Corps Ventures. I don't think I've publicized that, but Mercy Corps Ventures, Mercy Corps is one of the largest nonprofits in the world and and worked with them looking to try to do things on Gaza relief and looking at their ventures team for companies they invest in. And, oh. you know, I have, yeah, I've been chatting weirdly enough with a lot of the managers of celebrities who are looking mm -hmm. to understand how 
go about utilizing crypto for donation. And, you know, I was I was on the was it the giving block 2023 faces of crypto philanthropy. I was one of them. And to me, like, I think that that's really cool. I'm not I, I look forward to the day I'm wealthy enough to make personal philanthropic donations. But until then, I feel like it's fun to at least be able to on the side, use my knowledge and relationship to be able to make the world a, a little bit of a better place. That's really impressive, and I'm really inspired, really. So, Thank so you. cool. So, coming back to more, what is a macro, macroeconomic vision? Like, for example, how do you see more, like, in five, six years? Like, your perfect scenario, vision. Honestly, my wish for Morph is that we build real world applications, whether it's on finance, whether it is banking, whether it is social media, whether it is gaming, whether it's rewards, maybe it's a Pinterest, whatever it might be, a search engine. I want the blockchain portion of more to be invisible. Okay. The same way no, no one uses no no one knows when they're okay. using AWS. I would okay. love for us to be in the back and i want to be in the place where we have human stories of entrepreneurs from turkey from ghana from yeah. argentina from pakistan who can say they built a company on more they were given the resources they needed and they created something that millions of people around the world are using and that they were able to use this to help yeah. feed their families better that's that's really what I think about most is is that if we're really trying to decentralize the internet with crypto and blockchain, then we need to decentralize where the opportunities are. And at the moment and in the last years past, like the opportunity has mostly been in Silicon Valley or within the United States more broadly. I'm excited to see those opportunities be available to people more globally because of the decentralized nature of how blockchain works as a whole. And so for me, five years from now would be, you know, I get to sit back knowing that there are people who are launching companies that people are using on top of the blockchain that we put out there on top of this infrastructure, and they're becoming successful. If I was to make an analogy with a record label, it would be if we're the record label, I don't want to be Drake. I want to be in the position where we help make many Drakes around the world and to, to be people who are successful over hiring people who are buying homes, who are sending their kids to school because of an infrastructure that we launch that people then go and build on top of. And so that would be my idea of, of success five years from now. Okay, great. It's like, uh, so your philosophy is like giving an access to all the people like humanity mm -hmm. and make them, yeah. I would say, feel safer and wealthier, I, I can say like. Yeah, to afford, yeah, yeah, more finances. Okay, that's like really amazing. And uh, talking about like work life balance is as I know that you are based in New York, right? Mm -hmm. I've never been to New York, but I'm planning to. Nice. So, can nice. you just like, I mean, I got like lots of feedback from just like from those who are just living in New York. It's super difficult, mm -hmm. like your energy can be just wiped without like. Is it is it really like so? So how do you how you're managing your work life balance? How you're keeping your so, energy? Yeah, so I think New York is one of those places that's interesting. Either that you love all of that busyness and that it gives you more mm -hmm. energy, or you're in the other boat, which is you can't stand it and it's too much stimulation and you hate it. I'm born and raised here. This is home for me. I'm not I'm not a transplant who came here because of work. <laughs> And so for me, I love it. It energizes me to to be within the city. And when it comes to work-life balance, I think, you know, I'm also not one of the very young crypto entrepreneurs. I'm not old, but I'm, I mean, in crypto, I'm old. I'm 36 years old. And, you know, many of the people you meet in this space are 22, 23. I have gone past that place where I'm not going to have a work-life balance. I sleep seven to eight hours a night. I go to the gym four to five days a week. I do my best to have a healthy eating routine. I journal on a daily basis. I do my best to pray and meditate on a daily basis. And so for me, doing the things that help me in that way is massively important. I mean, I, I went to the gym this morning. 
I do my best to take, you know, the 10,000 steps a day, even if it means at the end of the evening, wow. I go take a long walk. And okay. so, yeah, because I realized that this is a marathon. You know, we were, mm -hmm. one of your last questions to me was, how do you feel morph would be what you consider a success five years from now? If I burn myself out, we don't get to five years. And so even if it means, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I move a little bit more slowly as compared to some of my peers, that's okay because all of them are playing a game where once they do burn out, it'll be a long time before they keep moving again. And, you know, 1% improvement every day compounded over many years is way better than moving super fast and then having to take a break for a long period of time. And so my philosophy in general is just like, I just believe things will work out. And, and, and I, I do my best not to stress things. I, I'm a person of faith. I feel too many people feel more is in their hands than really is. My life has shown me how so much has to do with luck that has nothing to do with my control. All I can do is do my best. And then I sort of leave the rest up to God. And I focus on making sure I take care of myself. Yeah, and you are right. I don't know. I have read uh, somewhere like kind of a really interesting statement. It's written that if you want to help someone, you have to start from yourself. So totally. you have to. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's so it's so, so true. And so that's why, you know, I've, the journaling has been something that's always been massively helpful for me. I've been journaling for just about daily journaling for almost seven years now, almost seven years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's been a very long time. And so, you know, the journaling and the meditation and the prayer and the exercise and the sleep. And when you think about doing those things compounded over years. That's where you really start to see it. But since it's a marathon, I'm okay with being slow and steady. Wow, that's like really impressive. So, yeah. And you said like daily journaling. I didn't get it. What does it mean, like daily journaling? So I'm, I, I have a, an actual journal that I sit down with on a daily basis ah, you, in the morning. Okay. And I, and I, and I write physically with, with like pen and paper. Wow. Usually I, I use... The morning to write about the day before. I don't ever actually know what I'm going to write about. It's just sort of whatever comes to mind. And then I just, you know, it's 15 minutes of my day. But what wow. I found is that it has given me a really good idea of knowing the things that are on my mind that I, that I don't realize are on my mind. It brings my subconscious to the forefront because I'm not like, today I'm going to write about this. I just sort of start writing about the day before. And so it might be, you know, I, I write for an entire page and I'm talking about something that I didn't realize mattered to me a lot. Or, you know, sometimes it's just being grateful for the dinner that I ended up eating. Sometimes it's frustrations with how work is going. Sometimes it's frustrations with how other things are going. Sometimes it's wow, just okay. generally, you know, so it's like it's just randomly just starting to write. And, and it allows me to bring whatever is somewhere in the back of my mind to the forefront because of how I do it. Mm -hmm. No, oh, that's amazing. So I have to try as well. So yeah, yeah. I, I suggest it to yeah. everyone. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, just uh, I will just like take this note. Yeah, I will just try today. So no, what, as we as we wrap up this enlightening conversation, it's clear that so you are not just building technology; you are shaping the future of how we use and think about crypto from pioneering crypto philanthropy to pushing the boundaries of what's possible like so with the technologies. So you are the visionary in uh, every sense of the word. I'm uh, super inspired. So here with us, uh, Azim Khan, who is the CEO of uh, uh, Morph. And I really hope that uh, we're going to hear more and more about this uh, project. And I really hope that you're going to go, uh, you're going to launch this mainnet and uh, more and more projects will get grants or will be just onboarded, et cetera. So in, for those startups uh, who wants just like uh, to try on your platform, what they should do, they should just uh, leave the request or apply. We have, just, we have I'm going to leave the a, link. Yeah, we have a very active Discord, but honestly, answer all of my Twitter messages on, on DMs. My, my Twitter handle is just A-Z-E-E-M-K underscore. They can just send me a message and I can connect them on Telegram with the right people that are within the team that can help guide them. And the last question, what is your top three uh, projects that you are really passionate about and you are all the time watching them? So can you tell us? 
that's tough because I'm constantly thinking <laughs> about new ones. That's a, that's a tough one. I think, you know, obviously more. And I don't want to give any favoritism yet for the projects that we have building on us. I love the work that the UNICEF Crypto Fund is doing, you know, but there's so many people. I admire what many of my competitors in this space are doing. I think BASE has done such an amazing job at getting new mm -hmm. people on the scene. You know, I don't, I don't see anyone as competitors. I see things as on-chain versus off-chain. And everyone who's, who's fighting for the future of making crypto something that we all use, I see them as all people who are on my side. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, and also, this is a kind of a verification that you are creating a super healthy competition as well. This is really important. So, you are just, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, actually, yeah. there is a room for everyone. I can say like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there's absolutely room for everyone. So I'm really inspired to, and also I'm really uh, grateful that you joined in this small uh, conversation. Stay tuned to that financial IT. Nadira Sadikova, Azim Khan, who is uh, one of the co-founders and CEOs of uh, MORE. So next-gen blockchain technology, and uh, definitely this is like really great milestone. <music>